victory song in my heart. Even praise unto the Lord. Amen. And you know, the Bible said praise is comely. That means it looks good on you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I like them. I like the shouts of God's people. I like the praise. Amen. Thank God. There's some burdens lifted tonight. Glory. Amen. I'm, I'm just waiting on the Lord. Now, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of the Lord. Amen. Just let God have His way. That's what we've been praying for. Amen. Just let the Lord have His way. Let God work tonight. Now, if the Lord wants me to, I'll pray. But it's hard to sow seed when the winds are blowing. The winds are blowing. <laughs> When he draws nigh. Oh, what a blessing. Go ahead. Like this. For what I feel in my heart. What the Lord's done for me. Bless his holy name. Mm. Grace, grace, grace. Been a long time since uh, that night I got to say, been, uh, I guess, 35 years ago when the Lord came by that church, the 11th Avenue Baptist Church in Dalton, Georgia. There's having revival meeting, two week revival meeting. And God come through there. And my wife had been attending that church, and, but I had never. I, I hadn't been, and she wanted me to go to that revival. And I promised her one night I'd go. And on that second Wednesday night of the two-week revival meeting, I went with her to church that night. God in His mercy and grace, uh, He sought me out. I didn't go looking for God. I went to please her. But God showed up. Amen. He is looking for me. And he, uh, he saved me that night. That's been 35 years ago. And if I live till uh, this coming Saturday, I will have been preaching for 30 years. I started preaching on the first day of April, 1970. And I'll tell you, there's been a lot of valleys, a lot of mountaintops, a lot of tears, a lot of blessings. I wouldn't take nothing from my journey now. Hallelujah. Well, y'all want to hear some preaching or you want to go to house? I want to 
right, let's look in the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Ruth, chapter 1. I'm, I want to thank you for being so kind to my wife and me this week. We've had a real good time. We got out and rode around today and looked at some of the beautiful scenes around here. Uh, Brother Later, Brother Bruce took me up to the campground, showed me the camp. What a, what a marvel, what a glory to the Lord there. And uh, thank God for what the Lord's doing here in this place. Ruth chapter 1, and let's read verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> the Bible said, Now it came to pass, in the days when the judges ruled, that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons was Milan and Kalion, Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And, and Mylon, Mylon died and, and Kilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-laws. That, that, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Our Father God, we thank you for this good word of God. We ask you that you would bless the reading of the scripture. Lord, may the word fall on good ground tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to, uh, Lord, to be able to receive something at thy hand. Uh, touch your unworthy servant. Give me that that I need to preach. Bless the hearts of the people. Lord, uh, save some sinner. Encourage the saints. Thank you for what you've already done. Lord, we, uh, we just marvel at your grace and your mercy. And Lord, how good you are to us. And Lord, for the good blessings that you've already given us tonight in this service. Lord, for the good songs. And Lord, how that you uh, blessed our hearts and helped us tonight. We praise you and we thank you for it. Now you help us now in the message. Lord, may your will be done. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can see the progression here in these scriptures. It says they went to Moab to sojourn there. Which means they didn't really mean to go and stay there. They meant to continue on in their journey. But the Bible said they dwelt there. Now I'll tell you, that's the way it is in the life of a backslider. Uh, they don't really mean to get out all the way, uh, don't really mean to dwell in that condition, but most of the time, they'll do just like these folks did here. They'll continue there till the judgment of God falls. And in Moab, they had no rights. Uh, they, were, they were not citizens. In Bethlehem, Judah, they had rights. Now, I'll tell you, we have rights here at the house of God. Uh, we don't have any rights out there in the world, hobnobbing with the world. Uh, now, the Bible said this took place in the days when the judges ruled. Uh, at the same time that the book of Judges was taking place, uh, this book of Ruth was happening. Uh, the book of Judges was a day of failure. Uh, the book of Judges was a day of falling away from the things of God. Uh, it was a day of forsaking the things of God. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. As the scripture said, and in the last chapter of the book of Judges, the last verse, it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. There was no rule. There was no authority. There was only confusion and violence and anarchy prevailed. And brother, when there's no king in your life, it'll lead to anarchy and sin and revolt against God. The book of Judges is called the book of gloom. Much like the day that you and I are living in, you get over 
over in the book of second, uh, first and second Samuel. Uh, there you have a man named David uh, uh, sitting on the throne, uh, and that pictures the Lord Jesus in his uh, on his throne in royal rule. Uh, uh, but to get from the gloom to glory, uh, uh, you have to go through the little book of Ruth, uh, uh, which is the book of divine grace. Uh, I'm glad I've been brought out of gloom, uh, and I'm headed to glory uh, uh, by the grace of God. Amen. Uh, Ruth got into the working of God uh, uh, by the grace of God. Never sinner uh, uh, that gets out of the dark gloom of sin uh, and into the glory of God. Uh, uh, they have to come just like this little boy about maiden uh, uh, by the grace of God. Amen. Uh, the book of Ruth uh, is a book of grace. Uh, uh, there's grace in every chapter of the book of Ruth. In chapter 1, uh, uh, there's the, com- uh, the compassion of grace. Uh, as God sends one uh, to Naomi down there in Moab uh, that he's visited his people uh, in giving them bread. Uh, He's telling them there's bread in Bethlehem. Amen. Uh, Chapter 2, we have the commission of grace uh, as you find Ruth uh, out there gleaning in the field. uh, And that's our commission today, neighbor, uh, to go out into the field uh, and to work and glean and labor uh, for our blessed Boaz. Uh, Chapter 3, there's the communion of grace as she goes down to the threshing floor and bows at his feet. In chapter 4, there's the companion of grace as she gets married and becomes his companion for life. And that'll be our end result one day, neighbor. We're going to a wedding, hallelujah. Thank God we're going to get married one of these days to the heavenly Boaz, the Lord Jesus Christ, the marriage of all marriages. Amen. Uh, There's grace in every chapter. There's grace in every corner. Uh, There's grace in the corner of a graveyard uh, as she stands over three fresh graves in Moab. Uh, uh, There's grace in the grain field. Uh, uh, Ruth found grace in the eyes of Boaz uh, as she gleaned in the grain field. Uh, uh, Hallelujah. There's grace at the gate uh, where uh, where, uh, uh, Boaz redeemed her. Amen. Uh, uh, Then there's grace in the genealogies uh, uh, where we read over in Matthew chapter 1 that this little Moabite that Gentile girl uh, uh, stepped over into the lineage uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, there's grace in every chapter. Uh, uh, there's grace in every corner. Uh, uh, then there's grace to consider uh, as this book of Ruth teaches us uh, uh, lesson after lesson uh, about God's grace. Uh, uh, Naomi teaches us uh, uh, the recovery of God's grace. Uh, I'm glad to report to you tonight uh, uh, that uh, uh, God can reach out uh, uh, to His one child. I'm glad brother God's got grace uh, to reach that child that's going to stray. Hallelujah. Uh, that prodigal son, that prodigal daughter uh, that's wandered away from God. Uh, I'm glad God's grace can track them down uh, there in the far country. Uh, I'm glad God's grace uh, can tender their heart. Uh, amen. Many times uh, uh, through teary sorrows uh, uh, brother he'll break them uh, and to bring them back to himself. Amen. Uh, uh, Ruth, uh, Naomi teaches us uh, uh, the recovery of grace. Uh, 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 Ruth teaches us uh, uh, the reach of God's grace. Uh, I'm glad God can reach farther down uh, uh, than any of us have ever been. Hallelujah. Uh, Moab in the scripture uh, is a picture of uh, uh, the epitome of wickedness. Uh, uh, Moab was off limits uh, to the people of God. Uh, a land run over with idolatry uh, and iniquity. Uh, but I'm glad. Hallelujah. I'm glad grace can reach to all the way to Moab. Uh, listen, neighbor. Uh, God's grace uh, can reach where you're at tonight. Uh, God's grace. Uh, somebody said, preacher, I'm hitting the bottom. Uh, God's grace uh, can scrape you off the bottom. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Elimelech and Milan and Kilion teach us the restrictions of God's grace. There comes a time, neighbor, when God's done done all he's going to do. And his judgment will step in. And if you won't have his goodness and his grace, there ain't nothing left but judgment. Boaz teaches us the redeemer of grace. 
Oh, what a, uh, this wonderful kinsman redeemer uh, uh, who went to the gate uh, and he was willing uh, and he had the means uh, uh, to redeem her. Hallelujah. Uh, now Moab is called uh, uh, God's wash pot over in Psalm 60 and verse 8. And in this story here, God washed three things. Naomi got washed out of Moab. Orpha got washed up in Moab. And Ruth got washed in. Hallelujah. <laughs> I've divided the book of Ruth in uh, these four chapters into days. And I want us to look at that, uh, these four days for just a minute and I'll be brief. I won't preach long. You listen fast, I'll preach fast, okay? Chapter 1, I call that wooing days or convicting days. Uh, God was doing a work in the life of Ruth. Uh, uh, Naomi pictures Israel here uh, as she went away from God. Uh, uh, then the Moabite Gentile is brought into the relationship with Boaz. Uh, uh, wooing days. Uh, everything God does, uh, uh, or everything God did for Ruth, uh, uh, here in this, uh, He does for every sinner uh, that comes to God. Uh, uh, God used three divine principles uh, in His dealing with Ruth, uh, and the same principles He uses uh, uh, in the dealing or in the wooing of every sinner. Uh, uh, notice uh, uh, the desperation she came to. Uh, I'll tell you, she was shut up uh, in a desperate situation. Uh, her husband had died. Uh, her, her father-in-law had died. Uh, her brother-in-law had died. Uh, and now she, here she is. Uh, uh, nowhere to turn. Uh, uh, what's she going to do? Uh, uh, no means of livelihood. Uh, 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 nothing to turn to. Uh, I'm telling you, she's in a desperate situation. Uh, I'll tell you, that's how I felt uh, that night brother many years ago uh, when I got saved uh, I got under old time Holy Ghost conviction uh, I mean uh, brother God, I saw myself lost uh, I saw myself without God uh, amen and there wasn't nothing I could do about it uh, brother, I, I was shut up uh, in a desperate situation uh, what could I do uh, I could feel hell coming up around me uh, brother I felt in my heart uh, I was going to die and go to hell uh, I got sick of sin. I tell you, I got sick of it. Somebody said, when will so-and-so get saved? They'll get saved when they get sick of sin. When they get a gut full of it. I tell you, I had a gut full of sin. I was wanting something better. I knew there had to be something better than what I had. I was desperate. And when you get desperate, neighbor, you'll get a look around and a see if there's some way that you get some help and I called on him in my desperate situation and he heard this poor man's cry and he brought me out of that desperate situation that I was in glory oh bless his name Desperation she came to. But then, in chapter 1 and verse 6, the declaration she heard. I'm glad God didn't shut me up in a desperate situation and forget about me. I'm glad I heard that there was bread in Bethlehem. Oh, thank God that the bread of heaven in Bethlehem. Wow, bless his name. I'm glad there's bread for you, dear sinner. Amen. Somebody that told them there was bread in Bethlehem. Aren't you glad that night or that day when you were so desperate and you were so hungry and you needed something? Aren't you glad somebody that stood up and told you that there was bread in Bethlehem? That there was food? Oh, thank God that there was bread in Bethlehem. Thank God. I'm going to start a meeting Sunday by the grace of God for the man that won me and my wife and that discipled us. And I started preaching under him. And 
He ordained me. I started a meeting in his church Sunday. Our pastor that loved us to God. Oh, I can't hardly wait. I wake up at night uh, thinking about getting to preach for my pastor uh, and see him sit there uh, and watch when God gets to blessing him uh, or watch him tears run down his face. Uh, oh, thank God uh, for a man uh, that stood up and told me uh, that I was bred in Bethlehem uh, and told me I didn't have to go to hell and uh, that there was help for me. Amen. Amen. Oh, bless his name. And then the demonstration she saw. She saw a demonstration in the life of Naomi. She saw something in Naomi's life that made her want Naomi's God. She said, Naomi, your God shall be my God. Boy, that's uh, that's what we need, boys. Uh, uh, We need to uh, be a demonstration for the glory of God uh, and let folks see uh, that we're serving the God of glory uh, and uh, uh, cultivate a longing in their heart uh, to know our God. Amen. Bless His name. The demonstration she saw. The book of Ruth is the eighth book in the Bible. And the number eight in Bible numerology means a new beginning. And when, when Naomi, I mean when Ruth broke with the pagan gods of Moab, and when she turned her face to Bethlehem, uh, she was turning from sin uh, to the living God. Uh, and brother, uh, uh, she trusted in the Lord, uh, and that brought a new beginning for her. Amen. And they got to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Not the middle. Not the end, but the beginning. And when you get saved, neighbor, that's the beginning of the harvest for you. Chapter 1 is wooing days. Chapter 2 is working days. In this chapter, we find Ruth out in the field working. Naomi's an older lady now. And she's not able to go work in the fields. And Ruth said to her, let me go and glean. Let me go. Wouldn't that be something if everybody in the church came and said, let me go, preacher. Preacher, would you let me go? Uh, let me work that bus route. Uh, let me go so winning. Uh, let me get out there in the field and glean uh, and labor. Uh, verse 3 said her hap uh, was to land in the field that pertained to Boaz. Her hap. Uh, H-A-P. I, I got an acrostic for that word hap. Uh, H-A-P. It means uh, his appointed place. Uh, his appointed place. Uh, what no coincidence uh, that she landed there in the field of Boaz. That God was working, neighbor. There was all kind of fields around. But God ordained that she be in Boaz's field. Amen. Verse 4 and 5, you know what happened? Boaz showed up. He showed up where the work was going on. In the midst of the reapers, the Bible said. I like it when the boss shows up, don't you? He can go anywhere he wants to. The the Bible said the field uh, is the world. And the world belongs to him. Amen. And he can go any place he wants to. But you know where he showed up at? He showed up where the reaping was going on. Showed up where there was some labor. I like that. Say, preacher, you don't show up around my place much. Well, maybe you ought to get to doing something. It's hard to get much done laying there with that clicker in your hand. There's a field. There's labor to be. There's labor, brother. There's a job to be done. Amen. And he'll show up where the reaping's going on. Verse five said to, he said to that unnamed servant, and it wasn't servants; it was a servant, a singular. That unnamed, he's a picture of the Holy Spirit, and he said, "Whose damsel is this?" I'll tell you. Before Ruth ever ever saw him, he had done took notice of her. Hallelujah! That she wasn't a gold bricker. That she wasn't a deadbeat. That she was working. She was bending her back. That she was stooping and laboring in the field. Thank God, he takes notice. Of that faithful gleaner. 
She wasn't laboring to be seen. She wasn't laboring to be praised. She was laboring in the field. Amen. And he noticed. And he noticed what he notices what you do too, neighbor. Or what you don't do. He notices that too. And I, when he, he gave her some privileges. I like this. He gave her some privileges. Verses 7, 8, and 9. She got to drink from the vessel. I like that. <clears throat> she, got to, she got to sit with the reapers and drink from the vessel. I call that sipping time. I like it. I like it when the ve- when the, uh, when that vessel gets passed around. Uh, you you want to know what was happening a while ago? Uh, the vessel was getting passed around, uh, and the brother was uh, uh, was sipping. Uh, he had just uh, hey, that was just a privilege. Uh, that was just one of them handfuls of purpose uh, uh, that he gave us, uh, uh, just to sit with the reapers uh, and sip from the vessels. Amen. I like it. And then. Another privilege, he said, dip thy morsel in the vinegar. Verse 14. That vinegar was like salad dressing. You know, you could just take that piece of bread and just dip it in there. Sop it around real good. I call that sopping time. When I'm preaching in North Carolina, I call it dipping time. Hello? I like to take that piece of bread that the preacher gives out uh, and just sop it down in God's gravy bowl. Uh, Amen. I like to sit at the feet of the reapers, uh, uh, God's faithful servants, uh, and and brother, just get a a good morsel of bread uh, that I can feed on uh, in the days to come. Amen. But you know what I like? If you'll read on right there, he just bypassed the reapers and he handed her some parched corn from his own hand. Son, it don't get no better than that. It's good to get something from the reapers, to get something from the preacher or from the teacher. But have you ever found yourself... I uh, sitting there uh, reading your Bible and, and boy, you, you, you've read it over and over and over and over again uh, but all of a sudden you'll be reading long uh, and something will just jump out at you. That's uh, something you hadn't ever seen before uh, and boy, you'll sit there and feast on that. Uh, uh, tears of joy. Uh, uh, God be a, b- a blessing you. Uh, boy, you'll underline that. Uh, uh, you'll underline it so hard. It'll go through four, five, six pages. Uh, uh, boy, it just blesses your heart. Uh, oh, when you get something directly from his hand. Ain't nothing like that. And the Bible said she was sufficed. He told the reaper, said, give her some handfuls of purpose. And she took, and she took some home with her to her mother-in-law. Her stomach was full, her hands were full, and her pockets were full. Amen. Chapter 3, I call that worshiping days. At the end of chapter 2, she tells Naomi about Boaz and how he took notice of her. And Naomi knows that he's a near kinsman. And matchmaking begins to dance in her eyes. And she tells Ruth, in chapter 3 and verse 3, she tells Ruth what to do. And here, what she told her in chapter 3, verse 3 and beginning, that's, he, we have the requirements of worship right there. What she told her, that's the requirements of worship. First thing she told her, she said, wash thyself. Now, buddy, wouldn't it be a blessing if folks had washed before they come to church? Amen. No, I'm talking about spiritually. Well, it's, it's, good, to, it's good to wash with soap and water, but I'm talking about washing spiritually. Before you get there, amen. Wash thyself, she said. Uh, get your heart clean. Uh, get in this Word of God. Uh, and spend some time in the Word of God and get your heart clean. Uh, amen. Uh, and uh, get your mind clean. Let that Word of God flow through you. The blood washes our soul. 
But it takes this word to wash our character and keep the world out of us and keep us out of the world. You've got to stay in this book. Read this book. I challenge you. Read the Word of God. I try to read my Bible through at least three times in a year. At least three times. Not counting all the other stuff. Uh, I, 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 like to read, I like to read the book of Proverbs. You know, there's 31 days in the book of Proverbs. Each, you can take uh, each chapter, you know, corresponding with the day of the month. Go through that book of Proverbs every month. You know why? Because it's the book of wisdom. It's the book of wisdom. It'll give you wisdom. As you go through and then for the last several months now, I can't get away from Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I, I've been reading that every day. That one chapter every day for months on end. I can't get away from that Hebrews chapter 11. Read that book. Spend some time in this book. Wash thyself. And, and when we do, when we come to church, there's a good possibility we can worship. And then she said, anoint thee, anoint thee. I'll put on some of that good smelling stuff. Amen. I'll tell you, when we get that blessed anointing of the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, that sweet smelling oil of the Spirit of God, uh, uh, boy, when, when that gets to flowing, uh, uh, there's a good possibility that we can worship. Amen. And then she said, put on thy raiment and get down. Put on thy raiment and get down. You don't go up to worship. You go down to worship. Get down. And if we'll get down, if we'll get off our high horses and get down and get humble before God, we can worship. Amen. We can worship. Uh, and people that take... Uh, that. Uh, own these stores and manage these stores. They know how to do it. When you go in them stores, first thing you see is them candy and bubble gum racks. I mean, it's right there, but as you go in the door, and all the good stuff, all the candy, the 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 bubble gum and the, and the tootsie rolls and the, and the M and M's and all that stuff's down on the lower shelves. You know why? So, in little, so when you take your little youngins in there, they can grab it. It's low enough. It's all the blessings them, that store's got, the good blessings are on the bottom shelf. And God ain't got no big, set, big tall shelves. All his shelves are bottom shelves. If you're going to get anything from God, you're going to have to get down. Get down. And when we get down, there's a good possibility we can worship. Chapter 4, I call that wedding days. Verse 15, he said to Ruth, he said, bring the veil. Bring the veil. Now, veil, that's what your wife wore when you got married. But now, this veil was not like the, the ones these girls wear over here. This veil was like those veils uh, those Eastern women wear. You know, they're, they're, it's a huge piece of material. Uh, and it goes down over, over the head, down over the shoulders, around the waist. Uh, and, the, and they, and they uh, tie it and, the, and they tuck it in. It's a big piece of material. And he told Ruth to spread that veil out. And he took that veil and he started filling it with barley. Six measures, the scripture says. Why, Ruth, I imagine Ruth was a little petite girl, just, why, well, she couldn't even pick it up. It was so big. I mean, old, old boy has tied up the corners of that thing, tied it up, and here's this big old uh, uh, pile of uh, barley in that vase. She couldn't even pick it up. And the Bible said he laid it on her. He picked it up and laid it on her. That's where we get that redneck expression, lay it on me. And uh, uh, he, he laid it on her. I 
can see her. She goes staggering off up toward the house uh, with that big old uh, uh, pile of barley. Uh, I told you a while ago uh, that she had a stomach full. She had uh, hands full. She had pockets full. Uh, and now she's got a veil full. Uh, oh, listen, it's good. Uh, but when you stomach, hey, it's good when, uh, when you start getting filled up. Your hands get full. Uh, but when you get a veil full, son, uh, uh, when you get all you can handle, uh, and all you do is just stagger around, uh, oh, like some of these boys was a while ago. I mean, son, you get out yonder in the third heaven somewhere, and you got so much on you that you can't hardly carry it. Well, wow, that's a veil full. Well, I like that. I do a lot of driving at night. And I'll get me a good preaching tape. Old Maze Jackson or some of them fellas, Edgar Thomas, stick me a tape in there. Or some good singing. Somebody's talking about the inspirations a while ago. Some good inspiration singing. Or, or I got I got that tape. My son them has got a, a tape, a CD. Son, I'm telling you, there's two or three songs on there. There's one. They, there's one they sang. Listen. It says, Nothing can touch me unless it pass through his hands. I'm telling you, son, I get me a veil full every time I hear that. I was coming out of Texas a few years ago, driving all night, and it was raining cats and dogs. And boy, I had one of them good tapes on, and I was a shouting, boy, I, I was a crying and a shout. You, you, you get that way, son. I, especially, I mean, boy, when, I mean, God just come and got in that car with me. And, and boy, I was a having myself a time. And I thought, and people was blowing their horns at me. I know I was going over on the other, uh, in the other lane. And I, I decided I'd better pull off the road. And I pulled up under one of them big old bridges. And I got out. I mean, it was a pouring of rain, and I'm just like this. I walking around that car about that time a big old 18 wheeler came by and about 55 gallon of water caught me right in the face son that'll knock a shout out of you <laughs> hey I needed that shout I needed that but I probably needed that good water too keep me awake for a long time and my clothes dry down I tell you buddy what a blessing to get a veil full and just get all you can handle amen worship I like it Naomi when she got up there to the house with that threw it down the floor Naomi said who are you why she knew who she was but what she was saying was are you Naomi? Are, are you Ruth the Moabitess? Or are you Ruth that's about to become Boaz's wife? And boy, she's seen all that barley. That big old pile of... I can see her and Ruth, they lock hands and they start dancing around that, that big pile. And Naomi's saying, son-in-law, son-in-law, son-in-law. <laughs> you know what they was doing? They was enjoying the earnest. That bar, that six measures of barley, that was the down payment. The earnest. And what you and I have tonight, the earnest of the Spirit of God, we just need to enjoy it. Amen. Hallelujah. Boaz got the elders in the gate, and the other near kinsmen had to be dealt with, but he wouldn't redeem Ruth. So Boaz went walking away from the gate with three shoes, two on his feet and one in his hand. That's how they would transact business back then. When, he, when they made that deal, that, that other landowner, he took off one of his shoes and gave it to Boaz, and Boaz possessed that shoe, and that was a token that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that transaction had been made, and uh, Boaz had redeemed Ruth at the gate. And at Calvary, what the law couldn't do, our near kinsman, the Lord Jesus, was able and willing to do. He paid the price. And the wedding took place and God gave Ruth favor and she brought forth a son. Can't you see Naomi and Ruth and Boaz looking at that little boy? And boy, they was praising the Lord and they was weeping and they was a crying and they was a shouting and a thanking God and a worshiping God. And 
They couldn't think of a name quick enough, I reckon, for the neighbors, so the neighbors named that little boy. They named him Obed. And that word Obed means worship. They seen him worshiping God, no doubt. And they named him Obed. Worship. And you know what our offspring's going to be when we marry the Lord Jesus? Little Obeds. Worship. Worship, worship, worship. While the ages roll, brother, uh, uh, we'll be worshiping Him. Uh, uh, he, uh, he'll start over yonder on that side of glory, uh, and it'll be echoing all over. Uh, uh, but we'll be worshiping Him while the ages roll. Ten billion years from now, we'll be worshiping Him. And when the wedding took place, Ruth didn't have to glean anymore. She didn't have to labor anymore. She moved into the palace when she married Boaz. And we're having to labor now, neighbor. We're having to stoop and toil. But the sun's are setting. The day's about over. And we're going to a wedding. We're just little old peasants out here gleaning. But he's going to marry us one of these days. And then we'll own it all. The world looks at us and says, what a ragtag outfit. But they just ain't read the last chapter. Son, we're going to a wedding. They think that wedding that Prince Diana, or Prince Charles and Princess Diana had was something. They ain't seen nothing yet. John the Baptist will give the bride away. When God says, uh, or John the Baptist will stand up and be the best bride or best man at the wedding. Over in John chapter 3, said that John the Baptist was the friend of the bridegroom. But that little apostle Paul, He'll give the bride away. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, Paul said, I have espoused you unto wisdom that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. God will say, John the Baptist will be standing there with the Lord, boy. I mean, he'll have his head back on. He'll probably have on the nicest tuxedo you ever seen in this world. And the brother, he'll be standing there, and, and, and God will say, Who gives this woman that'll be married to this man? And the little squint eyed, the humpback Jew will step forward. Only he'll have a glorified body like the Lord's body. And he'll say, I do. I do. And the apostle for the Gentiles, I do. Amen. Oh, what a wedding that's going to be. My son married a little girl from down in South Georgia, a little place called St. Mary's, Georgia. Her daddy's a military man, retired military man. He is rough as pig iron. And when Shannon asked Tracy to marry him, she said, I'll marry you, but you'll You'll have to ask my daddy. I said, you'll have to go ask daddy for my hand. Oh, he dreaded that. I mean, you just have to know Mr. Martin. He dreaded going and asking Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin had done run off every boy that ever come to look, even looked at her. And he, he went over there and they talked a few minutes and he finally got up nerve to ask him. Mr. Martin played with him a little bit, but he finally told him, said, yeah, it'll be all right. You go ahead and marry him. Well, Tracy's got a, a sister named Faith. Faith's a couple years older than her. And there's a boy got interested in Faith. And they went together a long time. She, they decided they'd get married. And she said, well, Shannon had to go and ask Daddy for Tracy's hand. Said, you're going to have to go ask for mine. And oh, Edward, I mean, Shannon was nervous about it, but Edward was scared to death. And he went over there and he finally got nerve up to ask Mr. Martin for Faith's hand. And Mr. Martin said, uh, yeah. He said, I guess it'd be all right for you and Faith to get married. But he said, there's, a, there's this problem. He said, uh, said, Faith owes me some money. And said, she can't marry you until that's been took care of. And Edward said, sir, I don't know how much it is. Whatever how much it is, I'll take care of it. You just tell me what it is, and I'll take care of it. <laughs> you, you got that, dude. <laughs> Woo! 
<laughs> the Lord said, I want them. Uh, but, uh, and God said, there's a matter of a debt. And he said, I'll take care of it. And no matter what it is, and no matter uh, what the debt is, he took care of it at Calvary. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Lord, have mercy. Ain't it good to be saved? A lot of us already visited the altar, but there's still time for you tonight. If you'd like to come, get something took care of here at the altar. We want to give you time to come and pray. Lord, it's good to be able to unburden our hearts at an altar of prayer. If you're not saved tonight, if you'd come, Jesus would save you. He's, he's not going to make you be saved. He loves you. He, he's, uh, he's gentle. He'll strive with your heart. He'll plead with you. But just like Arthur, you can turn and walk away. Please don't go away tonight. Don't choose darkness over light. Don't choose hell over heaven. Come to God tonight and be saved. One heartbeat, all, one heartbeat away from hell. If you'd come, he'd save you. If you'd step out right now. Brother John's going to lead us in a good number. We'll sing a couple of verses, give you an opportunity to come pray tonight, and then the service will be over. Well, we've had a good time tonight. Wouldn't it be a blessing to see somebody saved? If you're away from God, wouldn't it be a blessing to come? Say, Lord, I want to get back in the fight. Lord, I want to get things right. Come. While we sing. Say, Page 291. God's speaking. You move right now. Jesus is tenderly calling thee home, calling today, calling today. He's calling. Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam farther and farther away? Now's the time to Jesus move. Jesus is calling Come quickly. The weary to rest. Calling today. Calling today. Bring him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed. He will not turn thee away. Oh.